this up. All right, Denise McAllister is my guest. Thank you for your time, Denise. It's been a while. For those who don't know who you are, maybe you could just take a brief moment to tell us who you are and what you're all about. There's a description up here as far as to the books you've written. You're the author of, is it Real Romans? One. I am the uh, I'm the yeah. author yeah. of books. I'm the author of <laughs> What Men Want to Say to Women But Can't. I'm co-author of Spygate, the sabotage of attempted sabotage of Donald J. Trump. I wrote that with Dan Bongino. I'm a publisher of a new website called RomansOne.com, and um, the podcast there. I'm a host for the podcast Romans One, which takes uh, Christian principles and applies them and, and and looks at current events and interprets them through um, scripture and biblical truth and objective truth. And so it's an analysis of politics and cultural events from that point of view. That's pretty much what I'm doing today and just continuing to do uh, writing. I'm starting a new book on sexuality and sexual identity. I've written uh, a chapter in a new book that's coming out on the church and state. Uh, that was also about sexual identity. So I just cultural commentator written for a variety of uh, online magazines. People may know the Federalist and Daily Wire and PJ Media and others and um, been on tons of radio programs, BBC and NPR, been over on Fox News and CNN, Sean Hannity and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of different platforms, um, just doing cultural commentary and political commentary, but I'm mainly focused on religious, cultural, political commentary now. Don't forget Milo. That was a great session you had with him. I know you're really fond of him and I go back and forth on him. I, I, I could take him in short bursts, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I was I, I was interviewed on his show once. Yeah, he, he's um, he's great to interview with. We get along quite quite well on interviewing. <laughs> so, no, I kind he's an of interesting character. He's yeah, very smart. Yeah, no, he's highly intelligent and uh, and and funny too. The way he he uh, kind of frames his arguments as well. I th I appreciate it because it's well, I I don't know if it's. You want to get the you want to get the take of a gay man sometimes, you know. What I mean, especially with the with the left gone so wacky, and that's why I kind of want to hit on. I don't. I don't. I feel like I kind of wasted the resource with you last time because we only just talked a little bit about cancel culture, how it happens on the right, and now Michelle Malkin is screaming from the rooftops. I think it's. I don't know if I'm just hearing her more now or, or what, but um, she's. I don't know what's kind of triggered her to come so hard against, you know, the likes of Con Inc. And which, you know, she's one. Well, she did a video on Ben Shapiro the other day. So I kind of feel like we we talk, I talked to you over a year ago and we kind of danced around it a little bit. But you had full knowledge of it then. And we didn't really delve into it. So how do you see this all playing out? And what do we got to do? Is there any way or it does it really matter that the right seems to be divided now between I don't know. When Michelle was sticking up for the Groypers the other day, you know, she couched. I thought, why do we always have to say, you know, I don't agree with everything they say, but deep, deep platforming them's wrong. So, how do you see how this is playing out on the right as far as cancel culture or deep platforming? Well, it's been going on for a while. I mean, I, people who aren't familiar with um, Michelle's situation, uh, she, when she started doing some work with America First, um, which has been labeled a anti-Semitic organization because of some comments by its founder, um, Nick Fuentes. Um, I'm not gonna get into validating or not validating that. I think that he has a lot of humor that people have misunderstood and taken as opinion and him exerting some kind of fact. But um, regardless, it doesn't matter. He, the organization has a lot of good points to it as far as dealing with immigration and being concerned about the transformation of America from its founding principles, particularly its Christian princi uh, foundationing, foundational principles. And so Michelle works with them, has supported them, has spoken at their events in order to um, encourage that messaging, obviously none of the bad messaging. Well, when she did, um, she was immediately called out by Ben Shapiro, who, who basically called for her, her deplatforming and removing her because of her association with for America first. And then she was um, uninvited by the, uh, what was it, YAF, it's it's the Young Americans Foundation. It's, right. a, it's associated with Turning Point USA, Charlie Cook, 
Kirk and all of that crowd um, disinvited her from speaking at any of their events. She was also removed and kicked out and banned from Fox News. So um, because of Mirror Association not stepping back to see how much that Michelle Malkin, through many decades, even before these young pups like Ben Shapiro were crawling out of their diapers, were um, was doing a whole lot of wonderful work for conservatism and has and has consistently been a strong Christian woman, a Christian voice, a conservative voice that's been foundational to our politics. Um, despite this fact, simply because she associated and aligned with an unacceptable quote unquote group that was deemed unacceptable by the in group among the conservative elite, um, media elite, she has been basically silenced, banned, deplatformed, lost income. And so she talked a lot about it when it happened. It happened also with me. I was deplatformed because I offended a gay liberal who, who had falsely accused my husband of abuse. Um, and then I was deluged by his minions with threats for, of police phone calls and <clears throat> you know, social service intervention saying that my husband was abusing me when he wasn't. And so I basically yelled at him on Twitter and said something that was actually true, but it wasn't said very nicely. <laughs> and uh, I was immediately deplatformed by Ben Shapiro, Daily Wire, The Federalist, PJ Media. Um, ban I was also banned from Fox News. Uh, so despite the fact, like Michelle, you know, I've written, I've been a voice for conservatism for years. I, you know, have definitely have my cred in being able to promote conservative values and principles and been a strong voice in that, but because of one thing that offended a uh, sacred cow, um, both among libertarians and pseudo conservatives uh, and those on the left, I was deplatformed. And, you know, this is pretty much, that's not the only example. There's others, Alex Jones and, and Milo is another example of deplatforming that was very much generated by the right against him. Um, so Ben Shapiro was also, this is why Milo calls Ben Shapiro the poison dwarf. <laughs> you know, he, he's like, he's just a real problem. And when it comes to uh, maneuvering for the, the deep platforming of people on the right, uh, Tucker Carlson, and then uh, among all that, when that happened to me and also happened to Michelle, but I, I can only speak to my situation, um, there was no support. There was a much applauding, I should say, by many, many conservatives on the right for my deplatforming and actual calls in, in writing for my deplatforming and behind the scenes commentary <clears throat> about my deplatforming. Tucker Carlson himself um, was very uh, you know, supportive of my uh, deplatforming and said some pretty nasty things about me. So it, it it's just this kind of, um, I know it sounds very high school, it sounds very tit for tat, it sounds very nasty, but it's actually very serious when you start um, deplatforming people because they don't fit into a certain group or because they offend you because of some kind of PC thing. Um, you're acting just like the left. You're using the same tools of, and weapons of the left to go after your own. And then they, the reason why you're hearing about it more now is because because the left is actually getting more and more active in deplatforming during this time um, with tribalism on the rise and everything. So uh, as that's happening more and more, you're having people on the right, people like Ben Shapiro, who are themselves being attacked by the left saying, you know, we're not for cancel culture. You know, we're against this. We're against deplatforming. This is only something the left does. And, you know, and Michelle and I and others are going, whoa, 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 whoa. That's actually not true you're very supportive of, of deplatforming. It just depends on who it is and, and what you, you know, what, what it is that you're offended by. And, and our message is that no one should be deplatformed, you know, for offending the, the PC mindset that goes on around. We should have freedom of speech. And, and what I mean by freedom of speech, I don't mean that legally because private organizations like YAF that, that canceled Michelle, they don't have to hire people. What we're talking about, though, is that when you get into the practice of silencing in the public square each other for these kind of reasons, it, it can easily in the future move into a legal be action. And so you're, you're building and creating a culture of silencing and, and so that people become tolerant of it and then at some point look to governing authorities to do it for them. So if you don't nip this kind of thing in the bud in the public sphere, 
in this kind of attitude, then you're on a trajectory to loss of freedom, loss of free speech. It's also dangerous because you are, you're labeling certain individuals simply because you've pushed them into a group that you have deemed unacceptable. You've stigmatized them and delegitimized them. This is pure leftist, Marxist, Stalinist tactics in order to delegitimize. The, the scary end of that, of course, is scapegoating, the kind of thing that leads to violence against people who you don't agree with. So the trajectory of this kind of behavior is wrong. And when the right does it, it's it, to its own, it silences those of us, but it also really encourages that kind of leftist mindset and, um, and, and empowers the very people that they think that they're fighting. So when Ben Shapiro, for example, um, deplatforms me because I offended a liberal gay guy, he's encouraging and empowering the left in its canceling and deplatforming de anyone who opposes the LGBT agenda. He's, um, he's setting himself in the place along with the leftist who are doing damage to our culture. And that's just one example. It can be other PC darlings and sacred cows, whatever it is that you're being deplatformed for. So that's kind of what's going on. That's what has Michelle upset. And for these guys to come out and play all innocent and victim and like, oh, woe is us. You know, we would never do this to anybody. Uh, you know, no, you do. And you need to stop because it, it's destroying the conservative power movement um, in order to make a difference in this in this nation. I think you hit it right on the head there as far as, you know, it's causing division, which is bad. And I, I love your comments about the faux conservatives. I think we're, you know, I'm a, li I'm a little naive to this because I just came around to, I'm, I used to be addicted to Canadian politics, both municipally, regionally, <laughs> uh, provincially, and federally, and now I can't take my eyes off Trump and the American politics. I've learned more about how the American system works because I just never, I was just never into it. I've run 10 elections up in Canada. Uh, I was just never interested in American politics. And since Trump, I can't look away. So when, you know, part of my red pilling involved guys like Steven Crowder, uh, Gavin McInnes, Jordan Peterson, and Ben Shapiro. And so, like, I'm interested in your thoughts on faux conservatism because, you, you know, I feel like the voice needs to be united. Uh, and when it comes to Con Inc., whether it's Shapiro or Charlie Kirk, again, you know, the last time I saw Michelle Malkin on uh, YAF uh, or with Charlie Kirk's, I don't know who, where she, her, her message was fire, like absolute, like you know, she was saying the quiet parts. She was screaming quiet parts, which I really enjoy. And so because I've got a fondness for my, my wokeism, you know, coming, coming right from my far left you know, I wasn't an activist, but I ran for the Green Party. I mean, it doesn't get more left than that. And I still kind of see myself as a, you know, like take care of people, you know, like when it comes to social stuff, I'm, I still land on the left. Um, but what do you think it is with, with Con Inc? Is it just the money? Like it, whether it's Charlie Kirk's group or like these are bright guys. Uh, they they got to see I mean, I, I found Shapiro to be pretty objective on most issues other than Israel and maybe this topic. But, you know, where does a cancel culture come from? Is it just bottom line dollars because they're going to lose sponsorship and they figure if they support someone like you or you don't disavow, you know, the Groypers or what is it? America first. Yeah. You know, and Nick Fuentes, I don't know him. I haven't studied him. He he was clearly joking about the ovens and stuff like this is how can you take a joke that far out of context? Like, is there no room for humor anymore on the right either? Because, you know, I'm no. on the right now because the left doesn't stand for freedom of speech anymore. It doesn't stand for protection of your family. It doesn't stand for, you know, biological sex being, you know, unchangeable. You know, and so, you know, the things that matter to me most are the things that the left has literally abandoned. Like back in the day, you know, the left was all oh, free speech, peace, marijuana, no war, all this kind of stuff all sounds good. But now they're so ideologically possessed. I can not identify with them. I used to call myself a feminist. I can't put myself in that group anymore because of who the feminists have become. And I don't think that we, you know, there was a time where, 
you know, when I ran for the Green Party, the left needed a voice in 1993 because there was a lot of left issues that weren't getting attention. At some point, the, the you know, women needed to be advocated for. I don't think that's such the case anymore. I mean, we don't have laws that oppress women or minorities anymore. So what do you think it is about Conning that it's got them, you know, running scared, really? Is it just the checks? Is it just the sponsors? Is that all they're protecting is their their pockets? I think it's a couple of things. I mean, one, first of all, we need to realize that when we're in the political sphere, like we are, um, conservatism as it is today has, all, has only been has been just a few steps behind the trajectory of liberalism. So it's not any kind of purist movement anymore. Um, they really have not been founded on solid principles for a while. So um, let me put that aside because that's a little convoluted. The two big things of um, that's driving the conservative ink cancel culture is one um, basic in-group dynamics that have effect affected the millennial mindset. And most of the people who are in um, these positions that are doing the counseling are either older millennials, <clears throat> young Gen Xers, or just millennials. And, or, and so they're really, saturated with the mindset of do not offend and they will offend on some things and obviously we hear it i mean ben shapiro does does it daily but there are certain things within this group that you do not they run from and they still really run from the racism and the homophobia labels they really do in the misogyny to a degree so the if they're they're a lot more sensitive to being labeled a racist or a bigot or a homophobe or a woman hater than older conservatives. Older conservatives like me, I don't care what you call me. I don't care what you think I am, whatever. And I don't care if I'm cast out of every group under the sun because you think I'm a racist or a bigot or whatever. They don't have that attitude. And that attitude is, is both financial and personal and a relational. They're very um, group cliquish. They like, they need their group. They don't like having their friends upset with them. There's a whole lot more of a personal element here than people realize, you know, you, a friend, you offended a friend of mine, they, they have friends and so that they don't wanna have their friends mad at them. So they don't wanna be associated with anyone that will offend their friends. This actually does still even affect those who are the big people speaking out. Um, they still go to the cocktail parties. They still have their, their little groups that they hang out with. They still have their buddies and their little cliques in the media. They just do. I'm sorry to tell you all that, but they do. Um, in, but overriding that is very much the dollar. These people are in multi-million, million dollars or big business. You know, they make a lot of money and they are emboldened um, to speak by money but they're also held in bondage by money. They have investors that they have to be account accountable to. Most of the in these investors are libertarians, not conservatives. That makes a huge difference. A lot of the money bags that support the conservative movement are not conservative. That is a huge, 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 huge problem. I, I can't impress upon you how much of a problem that is. When you have your entire platform, your brand, your name, everything tied to reliance on funding that comes from people who ultimately fundamentally are not conservative, you're going to compromise along the way. And so when I was fired, when I was let go, whatever, pushed out by Ben Shapiro, I didn't, I wasn't on staff there. Um, he, uh, he said five times in my in the email to me, I have to protect my brand. I have to protect oh, the brand. Yeah. What was more concerning to him was protecting his money and his name and his investors than standing up for a conservative principle. Now, I know that my the tweet that I sent to this liberal guy was mean, but that wasn't why I was being deplatformed. It wasn't because I was mean. We're all mean on Twitter. Ben Shapiro has been mean. People have said asshole before. <laughs> I mean, that's what was in my tweet. That wasn't why. It was because I had defended a liberal gay guy and it was deemed homophobic by certain groups. And because of that, he could not be associated with me 
and have my name associated with his brand. And the reason I know why was one, he didn't want to have his friends think bad of him his, in his little group. But more importantly, he didn't want to lose his funding. I don't think he would have lost his funding if I'd kept writing. I think if he just ignored it and I'd ignored it and everybody else ignored it, it would just would have been a liberal hoo-ha and then we would have moved on. But, um, but he didn't think so. He thought he would lose funding, as did the Federalist, as did now, the Federalist recently has told me that they actually didn't fire me, that it was a misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, so I'm just going to throw that out right there. <laughs> I'll take them up their word, but that wasn't how I saw it. And they said, well, we thought you quit. And I'm like, well, I didn't quit. You didn't fire me. So I guess I'm still a writer at the Federalist. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, that was very recently that I found that out. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that they were all concerned about funding and about saving the brand, saving themselves, saving their professional career. It was more important than standing by a fellow conservative who was being attacked by the left and may have said something or, or was associated, in Michelle's case, associated with a group that you weren't 100% behind. Um, and so their choice was to deplatform. De and now Ben Shapiro just said, get out of my daily wire business and of course he has the right to do that mm -hmm. i want to make that clear all of these groups have the right to let go people whoever they want that's not the point of, of council culture it isn't about whether they have the right to fire it's about why are they why they're doing it and um, you know what are they supporting and doing it and in doing that what they're doing is empowering the cancel culture empowering this um, pc mindset of um, attacking free speech and in, in the name, uh, you know, as, as people who they themselves say that they uphold free speech. I mean, who hasn't talked about free speech more than Shapiro and people, the Federalists and people at Daily, you know, Daily Wire and YAF and Turning Point USA. And yet they'll turn around and as soon as their funding is threatened because someone has said something that might offend, a, a, you know, someone in their in group, embarrass them in some way or, or threaten their funding, they're going to deplatform you. And in some cases, call for other groups to deplatform you. That's what, when it gets really nasty is behind the scenes when um, this whole network says, not only are we going to let her go, but you all need to let her go too. And that's really evil. That's when you really get into silencing and, and stigmatizing so that these people can't even get jobs or they, can't, they lose money. They can't sell you know, their writings or whatever it is. They can't get on speaking platforms. And um, it, it's very problematic. And it's very, like I said, it's very Alinskyite. It's... Um, you know, so I don't, you know, when I hear them come out when they're attacked by the left and complain about the cancel culture, Michelle and I are going to go, yeah. well, then you need to stop it too, um, because you're really causing a problem. And, it, and I don't even, I'm not even as concerned about it causing divisions among conservatives. There will always be divisions as far as disagreements as there should be the day that the conservative movement is a monolithic one voice is the day that we're not thinking for ourselves and the day that we have some kind of tyrannical control over us and i don't want it what i want is to be able to speak freely within the conservative movement without being deplatformed and silenced and stigmatized and, and you know basically treated like you're a piece of crap and you have no reason to speak so um this is this is the problem with um with the whole council thing is, is that it's not so much the division that it's causing on the right fundamentally just as far as disagreement goes and lack of unity. It's that it empowers the very people who are trying to destroy the right. And that's my concern about it. It's not, oh, you guys are not causing, you're not being unified. I'm gonna mm -hmm. screw that. I mean, you know, we're not, we're not always unified mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, we haven't been unified about abortion forever. You know, we're not unified about even about what role government should play in certain issues. We're not we're not unified about even sexuality issues, uh, but we can still be unified on some of the big things. We can still have those voices speaking and continue to speak um, and stand for conservative principles in that. Um, but when you start deplatforming your own, you are empowering a leftist machine that is going to destroy you. And, you know, so you, you just, people need to be aware about how serious this is. This isn't just Michelle getting mad or me getting mad or being, anyone being bitter or anything like that. It's a real danger when, because what you got to understand is that the part, the leftist 
tactic, strategy to, um, to deplatform and to silence is to get, a, one of their strategies is to get us to do it ourselves. That's what they want. Not only that they do it, mm. they want you to do it to yourself. It's like, you know, they want you to become the snitches. They want you to turn on your own. I and mean, this is what is, makes it really effective is not only when they're doing it, but when you're doing it to each other. And so it's dangerous stuff and it needs to stop. So financial consideration couched and presented as virtue and principle, is that how you would sum it up? Basically, it's just, I mean, you would think a guy like Ben Shapiro would understand never kneel, never apologize. Don't justify, you know, stick up for your friends. Like, I mean, you would think a guy like that <laughs> knows, you know, and geez, for crying out loud, he, I don't know how many subscribers he's got. Gavin McInnes brags about 20,000. I know he's probably... A, you know, a fraction of what Shapiro and guys like Crowder does, you, you know, and they're funded by their subscriptions. There's, you know, no, no, probably a no, hundred thousand sure. people no. paying Ben Shapiro 10 bucks a month, aren't there? No, no, no. He's mainly, he's mainly funded by investors. Hmm. That's his major income. Hmm. It's not, he's not just selling a product and he's worried about his customers. Mm. No, no, it's investors. So that's that why he's so conscious about the brand, quote unquote. Oh, yeah. You don't want to lose your big old investors. I mean, a lot of these websites and some of them have lost investors and they're going they have to get loans and then they have they do have to rely on, um, you know, public. The customer, basically subscriptions, subscriptions. Yeah. They're, they're not they're not. I mean, they get money from their subscriptions and don't get me wrong, but no, no, it's their investors. It's that big, the big money that's behind this stuff. Mm. That's who they don't want to, I mean, money is such a big part of this and who the investors are and how they're accountable to the investors. And they're probably even concerned about losing subscribers as well. I mean, that's all part of it, you know, but it comes down to to money. And of course, one of them would probably say, well, I do have to take that into consideration. It's just part of it, it's just realistic. I just have to, because that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Well, then you maybe you need to, that's where I'm like, well, we need to stop having so much um, power and money put into single platforms and think that they are so um, irreplaceable and so indispensable that they can cancel their own because it's so, you know, they're too big to fail. And then, I mean, I think we're getting too much in the mindset of a lot of these uh, media voices as being too big to fail. The minute we're there, the minute we've come and become enslaved to the pragmatism of being a, um, having to desert your own. Hmm. And, you know, so we need to diversify the voices, diversify the money, I think, a little bit more, diversify the, the power in the, in the speaking and instead of lifting up just a few and empowering them so much that they become desperate and say, no, I, I can't, I can't lose, you know, lose this. We can't lose that. So we'll like do whatever we can and kill even our own side in order to stay speaking. It's kind of the mentality, you know, even of support of Trump himself, you know, too big to fail. And I say that as a Trump supporter. I mean, it's just the attitude of it in the long term. It, you know, we need to be careful and be cautious about that. I guess they can even, um, you know, fool the right. I mean, we've seen people like you and Michelle Malkin have been brought into and work, done work for and spoken at events for, yeah, for Turning Point. I mean, for crying out loud, Ashley St. Clair, they tried to cancel as well. As far as you know, because she was seen in a picture with Nick Fuentes, like, and yeah. you know, I you know, I, I like Ashley. I think she's a strong voice, kind of a like a you know a e girl or whatever you call her. But she's got an influence, and I think she went into it with a good heart. And then a picture surfaces of her at a late night party with Nick Fuentes. I didn't even know who Nick Fuentes was at the time. And next thing you know, she's done. And she went out. She didn't say much about it. Kind of you know was had some sort of class about it but it seems like even the conservatives are fooled by these guys until push comes to shove and then they bail on you and then you find out exactly who they are i guess yeah and it's a combination it's not just i, I do have to emphasize this isn't just the money the money is probably the biggest driving factor of the investors but it's it's also just personal it really is it's like i don't want to be associated with people who my friends don't like mm. um